Well, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm Jamal Khan. I'm the Chief Growth and Innovation Officer at Connection. Uh, welcome to uh, From Point A to Point Unbelievable with my special guest, uh, Andrew Lay, founder and CEO of Bui Health. So before we jump into it, I just want to give a quick uh, background on Andrew. Since founding Bui out of Harvard Innovation Labs in 2014, uh, Andrew had led the company through two successful rounds of fundraising, raising over 67 million with prominent healthcare uh, investors, including Optum, uh, Cigna, Humana, WL Hambrecht, uh, and F Prime. In 2020, Andrew was named by a business insider as one of the 30 healthcare leaders under 40 to watch. Uh, he's also been designated a digital innovator by Employee Benefits uh, News uh, and also by uh, Boston's Business Journal as one of the top 40 under 40 leaders and recognized also as the TED Med Hive Innovator. Andrew holds a doctorate of medicine from Harvard Medical School and graduated magna cum laude from Harvard College. So Andrew, thank you for being here. It's great always to uh, have these conversations with you. I know we've had a bunch of sessions, uh, but I think for, for the audience here, it would be good to give everyone a, a good context around Bowie Health itself, a company, uh, the vision, the idea behind uh, it, and, and especially your personal journey through that process. Yeah, no, thanks, Jamal. Uh, really great to be here. Um, yeah, so the founding story, uh, I was uh, in my last year of medical school, I was gonna go be a neurosurgeon. That was like kind of my life's dream. And the last rotation I was in the ER and I kept seeing all these patients who were Googling their symptoms before running to the emergency room and just kind of doing the wrong thing, you know, all the time. So, you know, real story at 2 a.m. I saw a woman with a jammed finger uh, followed by a guy who had an ulcer on his foot from a history of poorly controlled diabetes. Uh, the, the ulcer had become infected and the infection was spreading and we had to amputate his leg that night. Oh. And I still remember, you know, talking to the first woman, I'm saying like, hey, you know, you're fine. You know, you can go home. Uh, she pulls out these printouts from WebMD, you know, telling me why her finger, uh, she, why she thought her finger was broken, why she waited eight hours in the ER, and now this is like a $2,000 visit. And then strikingly, like the very next person I saw, I was like, sir, I'm so sorry, you know, had you come in a couple of days ago, we could have saved your leg. You know, he pulls out these printouts from the internet telling me why he had waited and why he didn't think you know, we should amputate. And then unfortunately, right around then, my dad had a, a mini stroke. Uh, he didn't go to the doctor. I found out it, about it you know, months later. I was like, oh my God, why didn't you call me for help? And I, and I actually have two younger sisters who are both docs. And he was like, you know, uh, I was worried about you know, that I was gonna bother you guys. I was like, oh my God, okay, why didn't you Google it? And he was like, I don't trust what I'd find on Google. Uh, and for me, that was this emotional tipping point a couple of months before graduating, I took this super delusional sabbatical from school, uh, started Bowie. The joke, the joke in the family is that my dad had a second stroke when I told him. Um, but started Bowie and we just became obsessed with this idea that for consumers, it's almost impossible for you to shop for healthcare because you have to be like a doctor and an insurance expert rolled into one in real time. So that knowledge gap, like you're just very unempowered to do it. And so we built this technology uh, starting in 2014 uh, that talks to you like a clinician. It reasons based on clinical literature. And after about two minutes of this back and forth, it looks like you're texting with someone. It helps you figure out clinically what's most likely going on. Uh, we launched that in 2017. Today we have about 30 million users uh, who come to Bowie organically every single year. And then we started selling to uh, insurance companies like United, Cigna, Humana, as well as self-insured employers. So we started to get, get the insurance angle and then about a year ago, we actually then shifted into becoming like a full-on marketplace. Uh, I mentioned before, um, you know, healthcare not being shoppable. The vision of the company is in some ways to build like the Etsy of healthcare, where uh, we, now we have digital health companies, individual doctors, practices, pharmacies, over-the-counter medications built onto Bowie such that as a consumer, you have no idea what's going on. You come onto Bowie, we actually give you the technology to understand what it is that you should pick, what service um, is right for you and to do that type of matching. And we think a lot about, you know, today when you're, like you really your doctor is shopping on your behalf. They're telling you what's, you know, what to buy, what to take, what specialists to see, but they're not, they're kind of like imperfect shoppers, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't know what prices are, they don't understand your insurance, they don't know like the whole world of options. 
And so we're really trying to replace the shopping component of a doctor's job and allow doctors to care and treat for patients, mm -hmm. but really give people kind of the technology to do something that is uh, today kind of locked in the brains of a select few. Right. Right. So let's dive into sort of the funding aspects of your business. I mean, as a, as a prior founder myself, I, I always remember it was a nagging issue that sort of constantly sort of aligned with everything you do as a founder. Um, so talk to us about that journey, you know, that initial, I mean, you were going down a very structured path to become a, a, a neurosurgeon out of Harvard, uh, but you jumped into the deep end of the, of the entrepreneurial pool. Um, I think with limited funding, how did you go through that process and any ideas or thoughts that you can share with aspiring founders um, in, in that particular challenge in the early stage of your company? Yeah, you know, in the early stages, um, I, I think a lot about like risk mitigation. So for me, I took a very intentional uh, sabbatical from school instead of graduating and then starting the company because if it all went belly up, I could just go back to school and then go to residency and, and basically there would be no blemish mm -hmm. in my you know, kind of track record. And I you know, had a stipend from school. I like, lived with, uh, in a very, like, um, with very low fixed costs, just trying to get, save our way to getting an MVP. And so we were just really scrappy, my co-founders and I, just to buy ourselves enough time. And then the, the kind of crazy story is uh, uh, we were dealt with some adversity actually. Uh, the apartment that we were working out had burned down in a fire. Uh, I lost all my stuff. Um, you know, we, and I ended up becoming like somewhat of a grifter, just like sleeping on couches and just trying to you know, get to a, 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 something that I could show the world like, oh yeah, you know, we don't wanna raise money off this. And then crazy enough, um, uh, we had this lucky break. Um, I was invited to kind of present what we're up to to uh, some donors. I went up there, I had like t-shirts and jeans on, everyone else was in suits. It was kind of this hoity-toity, you know, type of event. And I, you know, I said, I'm sorry that I look this way, you know, just lost all my stuff in a fire, but this is what we're up to, you know. And, um, you know, as I was walking out, someone reached across the table and gave me their card. And turns out this individual, you know, founded a really famous uh, marketing agency and then went on to be the chairman of Partners, which is a big healthcare system in Boston for a really long time. And when I met with him in person, he was like, you know, uh, what I liked about you was like, one, you looked like shit, you know, when, <laughs> when I saw you, but you kind of had the gumption to just like, you know, keep going. And he cut us a ch our first big check. And that was what allowed us to grow and got to our series A, series B, series C. And every single time, I think the thing that really stood out to me in terms of like learning was just like resilience, like how, how that has to be, that, that is the key ingredient to winning because you get turned down 99 times and you have to get up that hundredth time with the same gusto and passion for the next conversation uh, in, in order to fundraise. And I, I think that has been uh, kind of a through line through this entire process. So let's double click on that just a bit. Um, you know, as, as someone who now is an investor in tech companies and have been a founder in the past myself, I always find the dynamic for founders, especially uh, around the, the cash versus equity challenge. Um, you know, as, as you probably also know, that cash is king usually in the early stage of any company's development. But founders are sometimes either too liberal with their equity or, or they're sort of, uh, you know, generally tightly embrace the equity way too much. How did you strike that balance? And if you think back in those early stages when you were doing those initial rounds, um, are there any lessons that you would like to share with us or any lessons or perhaps redos that you wish you could do? Yeah, I think there are two lessons and they come with like, I think two things that are true that seem to be at odds with each other, but they're true at the same time. One is that very early on uh, equity, or sorry, cash is very expensive and cash is like oxygen. And so when I think about those things and applying it to like what I learned early on, I was you know, looking back on it too liberal with my equity. Like I, I, I like really focused on getting cash in the door, but cash is just so expensive. So when I talk to founders now, I, I talk about, you know, trying, it, you know, once you need cash, it really is like a light switch, like zero or one. So it, if you can just prolong the period of time in which your fixed costs are low enough that you can build enough traction to get into later and later stages such that, you know, you get out of the more expensive phases of, uh, cash needs, you know, and that means like 
you know, keeping your day job, you know, living with your parents if that's possible, like, you know, uh, don't buy a house, you know, just really uh, stay lean in order to get as much traction as possible. And then, you know, the second learning, going back to this, like, cash is oxygen, I think, you know, the CEO's job is to have cash in the bank. And when you do decide to flip that switch, I think the paradoxical thing is, like, it, when you do raise, raise as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds at odds with what I just said, but once you do need money, uh, the opportunity to raise can go away like that. And like, I'm looking, reflecting back now, I'm in digital health. A year ago, digital health was like white hot. Like you could, everyone was raising crazy valuations, crazy amount of cash. And then now the market has totally done a 180. And so when I think, you know, I think back, I was like, you know, looking back a year ago, I was like, oh man, I should have probably raised more just to give us more oxygen so the company continue to grow and, um, you know, have more of a buffer. And so I would say those are two things that I've learned in, in, the, in the process. Well, I guess, I guess the good news is you have cash now. You're, you're certainly an established company. And, and the next challenge for any organization in your stage is how do you scale? And, and that becomes a very different set of challenges. Um, so Bui is certainly on that upward journey. But what are some of those things that keep you up at night? Uh, anything, any reflection that you can give, again, aspiring founders and some of your insights with respect to those challenges as you're now scaling your business to that next level? Yeah, the scaling thing that worries, that keeps me up at night is uh, product market fit. And I think the insight um, is that product market fit, in my opinion, is, is a dynamic thing. You can have it and then you can lose it. And I think with scale, and you know, I'm defining scale here as you have more users or you have more clients. The, uh, there's this really classic book you know, uh, written in the 19, early 90s, so 30 years old now, uh, Crossing the Chasm. I tell every founder that they should read it. Um, and the, the whole concept is that as you enter a market, uh, penetrate a market, you have your innovators, your early adopters, and then you have this massive gap, this chasm, and then you get to the early majority, late majority, and laggards. And so many companies get product market fit in the innovator and early adopters, and then they hit scale, mm -hmm. trying to get that next wave of users or clients. But the product market fit in that world is different than the product market fit early. And so they end up dying in the chasm. Mm. And so for me, that keeps me up at night because we're trying to get more users, we're trying to get more clients, and we're building a marketplace, so you have two sides to the marketplace. You have two product market fit problems. You could die twice in two chasms. Mm -hmm. So I like lay awake at night just thinking on this like, you know, Queen's Gambit, like, you know, thinking all the machinations of like how we make sure that we have product market fit as we scale. All right, excellent. Um, so you certainly had a great idea. You had a vision that you executed. There was the initial funding from an MVP perspective, subsequent rounds, uh, and now the challenge from a scaling perspective around product market fit. Um, but if there's one consistency in each of these elements, though they're pretty dynamic in themselves, is the team behind this. Um, and I think we'd all agree that that is perhaps the most critical component in building companies over the long term. So how did you manage that hurdle? And again, I think with every one of these stages, that hurdle changes. We were having that discussion on the back end as well. Um, so that initial hurdle of getting the right folks aligned for the right tasks, uh, and then navigating the personalities and egos, and then at the same time trying to develop a culture, that's a pretty significant challenge for any founder. Help us understand your ability to navigate those challenges. Yeah, I strongly believe that the most important ingredient to a healthy company is trust. Uh, the best business book I've ever read is this one called The Advantage that you know, talks about this idea uh, that trust is, you know, again, the kind of the foundational element. I lucked into having three co-founders besides myself who just intrinsically trusted each other. I think it's because we had like a shared background in terms of being friends before we started Bowie. Uh, but that really, eman it really emanated from there, it grew from there. So as we scaled from four people to 20 to 50 to 70, like, the trust was always like a foundational component. And then on top of that though, we did a lot of trial and error. Uh, we figured out that there were certain people who just didn't fit in our journey over time. And that every single time that happened, we would try to coach them in the element that just like wasn't working and started to recognize there are some things that just like are hard to coach in a certain time period. And so we had these five core attributes at Bowie, uh, being kind, be, being a linear communicator, uh, being gritty, 
uh, intellectually curious, uh, having a growth mindset. And I can literally name, or I can think of, I'm not gonna name them here, <laughs> like five teammates that just didn't fit there because they didn't have one of those attributes. And so now, uh, our- And you felt that these attributes were not coachable? Very hard to coach. I think they're coachable in a longer time span, but within the time horizon of a startup, mm -hmm. uh, it was very hard to like correct or mm -hmm. like improve. So now we have interviewers that are trained to look at all five attributes and it's allowed us to scale with like minimal mistakes uh, kind of going forward. So, so at, through this journey, again, of bringing folks on, uh, I, I know in this, this particular session is about um, celebrating our IT superheroes, those, those folks that, that work behind the scenes, often unsung heroes. Was there anyone in particular within your organization that you would sort of classify as that solid rock that you could always rely on? Yeah, our, our uh, first hire, a uh, man named uh, Jimmy Mills, um, now runs our entire DevOps uh, team. Initially, was an individual contributor, uh, full stack engineer. Those attributes I described earlier, he's like a 10 out of 10 across the board. And we just lucked into having that early employee who was more like a founder than, than anyone, right? Um, and it's crazy, he was our first boomerang, so he was the first one to like leave the company and come back and just watching him grow over time. So he went from like building our first app uh, over the weekend or like building our first Alexa uh, integration to now you know, basically managing all of our AWS costs and like cutting those in half. And it's crazy seeing him scale with the company and I would say he's our superhero. Oh, great, excellent. Well, Andrew, thank you again for the incredible insights into Bui Health's uh, journey and success story. We could certainly sit here for another hour, uh, and I look forward to sort of continuing this discussion even after Disrupt. So, folks, our IT professionals are sort of these millions of unsung heroes uh, that keep everything within our organizations running smoothly uh, for founders like Andrew and for others uh, in our audience as well to help our, our company scale, to help them build, to help support that infrastructure. Let's now have a, a look at a small example of the challenges some of these IT superheroes, in this case, beat a hero at Connection uh, and a customer at Connection uh, and how those challenges are the challenges he faces every day. So let's roll that. Pete, red alert. Oh boy. So I uh, accidentally printed a bunch of sensitive documents, uh, salaries, personnel files, social security numbers. I printed a photo of uh, me in one of those uh, Euro swimsuits. You get canceled, right? Of course. No, I didn't do that. Printer panic. Printer panic, Pete. Well, at least you didn't print the photo of you in that European swimsuit, right? For all your IT needs, for Pete's sake, talk to the experts at Connection. Now, we all have our beats, I'm sure, in our organizations, which is why uh, this is the second year we are presenting the IT Superhero Awards at TechCrunch uh, Disrupt. I'm going to ask Pete again to help me present this year's winners. This category is Best Rookie. Here, we award the person who is new to the team but proved themselves immediately invaluable. Some of you will think this is about baseball. It's not. And the winner is Ben Esquivel, Director of Information Technology, Imperial Unified School District. Good job, Ben. The next category is Best Catch. Here we celebrate the person who went the extra mile to find and solve a problem no one else could find or solve. And the winner is John Fisher, System Administrator, Visiting Nurse Association of Northern New Jersey. Way to go, John. The next award is for most unshakable. Here we award the person who stayed calm and strong under the most crushing of pressure. And the winner is Lisa Michelle, Customer Service Support Manager, Information Technology, Rochester Electronics. Way to go, Lisa. The next category is Best Superpower. This award goes to that one IT professional who has a skill that can tackle any problem and leap over any tall building. It, well, not really but you get what I mean. And the winner is Chase Zeman, Chief Data Science Officer, co-founder, cart.com. Next up, the award for best team leader. Here, we award the person who inspires everyone to go that extra mile every day. And the winner is Patrick McGee, 
Director Technology Support Services, St. John's County School District. Way to go, Patrick. Congratulations to all five winners, one of which will be named the ultimate IT superhero. There's a cake involved. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you, Pete, and thank you, Andrew, again uh, for um, every uh, for our discussion today, and thank you for everyone joining us. Uh, and congratulations to the 2022 IT Superhero Award winners. Uh, the IT Superhero Award winners will choose from three charities that help underserved communities gain skills in technology for our Connection Cares team to make a donation on their behalf. And, and finally, please do join us back on the main stage at around 4 or 5 this afternoon, right before the Startup Battlefield announcement, uh, to see which one of these five winners will be awarded the ultimate IT superhero designation and the cape that goes along with that award. So, Andrew, thank you again. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Jamal. All the best. Thanks. Cheers.